the ways that um, that we can, you know, be more financially sustainable and make um, sound decisions now and in the future. Um, so just want to run through a few housekeeping items. Um, we are recording, as the message said, uh, we are recording this event um, for future use and it will live on our Young Alumni page. Uh, with that being said, um, you do not have to um, participate in any way. Um, if you choose to, great. Um, there will be a Q&A session um, towards the end as um, Josh and Spencer wrap up. And so if you have questions, please feel free to ask those at the end. Um, I just want to, um, before I introduce them, um, just uh, read the online accessibility statement we have um, as resources available um, as a part of our online events. So your experiences here at SNHU are important to us. It is our policy and practice to create an inclusive and accessible learning environment. If you'll need access to do a disability in any order to participate in a future event or activity, please notify the Office of Alumni Engagement as soon as possible at alumni at snhu.edu or 603-645-9799. And students should contact the Online Accessibility Center or Campus Accessibility Center. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, Josh and Spencer. Uh, Spencer graduated from SNHU in 2019 with a master's degree in finance. And Sp Spencer and Josh are colleagues at, at that work at the Commonwealth Financial Group based out of Boston, Mass. Uh, we're so excited to have you both here with us tonight to speak about budgeting, best practices, and actionable steps we can take towards uh, our financial decisions after the session. Um, I'm going to hand it off to both of you, and um, I'm here if anybody has questions, um, but it is all yours. Thank you, Ali. We uh, appreciate you all hosting and those that have decided to attend the riveting topic of uh, budget building. Ali and Spence and I were, were joking uh, a, a bit earlier about how exciting budgeting can be. Uh, and while that's probably not true, uh, it is an important topic and it's definitely one that can make a pretty big difference in our financial well-being and our financial life as a whole. So thank you again to Allie for hosting Spencer and I, uh, and we hope that everybody in attendance gets uh, a piece of valuable information or hopefully a few pieces of valuable information as we go through uh, our presentation. And there are some takeaways that you, know, you can put into action tomorrow that will hopefully get you uh, on, a, on a better, clearer path towards some of the financial goals that you all have. So I am going to share my screen and be mindful that I'm not the most technically savvy person in the world. So this might take me more than one try. Did I get it? Am I good, Spence? Looks good. Am I good? Oh, yep. <laughs> I've been practicing all day for this. <laughs> um, so uh, Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Flanagan, as, as Ali said, and I'm joined with uh, Spencer Lyons. We are excited to be here today to discuss building a budget as part of our financial well-being education series. We know that the route to financial well-being is different for everybody. It's definitely not a one-size-fits-all sort of cookie-cutter situation, but regardless of what path you decide to take, a strong grasp on the fundamentals is imperative in helping you build what we call our financial IQ. So today, we're gonna to focus on how to create a comprehensive budget that takes into account your income, expenses, savings, and I think maybe most importantly is life priorities. Uh, a budget helps you decide where to spend or allocate your money and whether you can spend less money on some things or more money on other things. You can't accurately make those decisions without a budget. Before we start, uh, I'd like to point out that we're simply providing information that can help you make decisions on how to establish a budget for yourself. What you ultimately decide to do is entirely up to you uh, so the information provided here is not written, it's not intended as specific tax or legal advice. I am not authorized, neither is Spencer to give tax or legal advice. We know where our strengths are, we know where our weaknesses are, and we're definitely not attorneys, we're definitely not CPAs. Um, so you are encouraged to seek advice from your own tax or legal counsel. 
Uh, if you're currently involved in the estate planning process, you should work with an estate planning team, including your own uh, personal legal or tax counsel. So now that we get uh, the, the, that stuff out of the way, uh, as we start our discussion on budgeting, I wanted to point out that budgeting goes hand in hand with your financial well-being. And understanding what we mean by financial well-being can help put everything that we're going to talk about tonight in the context. Financial well-being, as is, uh, defined by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, means having control over day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month finances, having the capacity to absorb a financial shock, being on track to meet financial goals, and having the financial freedom to make choices that allow one to enjoy their life. As we go through today's discussion on budgeting, we'll be addressing the first bullet, having control over day-to-day, month-to-month finances, but we'll also touch on how budgeting can help you be able to absorb a financial shock, stay on track to meet financial goals, and lastly, I think what we're all striving for is that financial freedom to make choices and enjoy your life and, and how you see fit. So with that, let's begin. Budgeting helps you make informed decisions about your finances. For some people, maintaining a budget is pretty simple. For others, even me, I've been in finance for 12 years, it's a chore. It's something that I have to force myself to do. Uh, and you know, for, for others, sometimes it's just trying to figure out, is, is there enough money to pay the bills? So like most things in life, your success at budgeting is gonna be measured by your effort. So today we'll talk about uh, some things that you may consider when creating your own budget. What we'll talk about today, again, I'm gonna reiterate this, uh, is intended as a guideline, right? Only you based on your personal financial situation can decide which is the best approach for you. Spence and I uh, don't know everybody's specific situation, so it would be a bit irresponsible for us to you know, make pointed recommendations. Okay, to start a budget, first thing that we need to know is what's the household income, whether that's individual income or it's combined income, if that's applicable, to understand how much money you have to work with within your budget. So you want to determine the amount of your take home or after tax pay from three perspectives. One is annual, then monthly, and then weekly. If there's another income in the household that should be considered in your budget, make sure it's included. So myself, I'm, I'm a financial planner. That's what I do for a living, but I'm also a staff sergeant in the Army National Guard, right? I receive uh, monthly monthly payments when I go to my drill and things like that. Uh, it can also be other income like hobbies, for example, right? Something that's outside of your primary income, such as your salary, you still wanna make sure that you're tracking that. If your income varies, um, maybe it's seasonally or you get a quarterly bonus or an annual bonus, you wanna keep track of those changes and plan your annual and your monthly budgets accordingly. Regardless of what your income is, Having a budget helps you make the most of your money. Once you understand your total income from all of its sources, you need to spend, and this is, I think, the hardest part for the majority of people. It was definitely the hardest part for me. You have to spend at least a month tracking every single penny you spend. It's the only way to get a complete in full understanding of how much money is going out the door every day. Uh, I had somebody do this, I think um, uh, a, month, a month or yeah, maybe, maybe two months ago, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, and he, he, he figured out that he was spending $400 a week on, on sandwiches, on subs. He, he <laughs> loves subs. I don't know how you spend that much money on subs, if they were gourmet subs or whatever the case was. I didn't dive too deep, but uh, he was shocked at how much money he was spending on, on subs. Um, so you can use an app to track expenses on the go. That's definitely what I suggest, especially in you know, today's tech world. Um, you can save every single receipt or you can carry a notepad with you so you can jot down the date, reason, and amount of every single cash outlay, right? Such as a cup of coffee on the way to work. 
Now that seems a bit more tedious than just having an app, but again, to each their own, right? You know your situation. And if you're somebody who likes to write things down and keep lists, that's how my wife is, um, then by all means, whatever works for you, whatever's gonna get the job done. The important thing is to know exactly where your money is going and how much you're spending on individual purchases. Um, also keep in mind that the last 30 days may not account for variable spending in other months, right? So for example, uh, I tend to spend a lot more in holiday months like November and December. I'm sure that that's true for, for the majority of people. So you're gonna wanna keep this in mind as well. Uh, and the reason that we do this is that you can't create an accurate budget unless you know exactly how you're currently spending your money. Okay, next we need to understand what are our expenses. And there are two different types of expenses you'll need to consider when assessing your budget, fixed and variable. Fixed expenses are your expenses that don't fluctuate each and every month, such as mortgage or rent, your car lease or auto loan, insurance premiums, right? The costs are pretty much consistent and the payments are due each and every month. Variable expenses are those things that can change depending on your own habits, lifestyle, you know, grocery bill, uh, summer's coming, right? We're grilling. Hopefully um, we, you know, can, can open up here a bit soon and there'll be barbecues and, and that grocery bill, you might see a spike towards the end of the summer. Um, you know, the amount that we spend on clothes, uh, vacations, car maintenance, costs, um, and so on and so forth, just to name a few examples. And they can change based on how much you buy and which products and services you're using. So your budget should focus first on allocating monies to your fixed or necessary expenses. Once you have all of your expenses accounted for, you can categorize where you're spending your money. So let's categorize spending into three distinct groups. We have living, wants, and debts. Your living expenses are housing, food, clothing, gas, insurance, right? The, the necessities that, that we need to, to live and survive. Your wants are things you spend money on for yourself or your loved ones that aren't necessities, such as in the normal world, uh, dinner out, movies, entertainment, the fun things that we all used to be able to do. Um, with the third category being debt, right? Should include all the money you spend each month on your debt payments, student loans, credit cards, auto loans, um, so on and so forth. So living, wants, debt. Once you have categorized your spending among living, wants, and debt categories, add up the dollar amounts and see how they compare to uh, this simple rule of thumb. 50% of spending should go towards living expenses, which include mortgage or rent. We don't put that into the debt category. That's, that's a living expense. 30% of spending should go toward wants, and 20% should go to debt. The 50-30-20 rule of thumb is a guideline, right, for you to use in creating your budget. People will spend according to their preference and, of course, their, their ability. But the 50-30-20 rule is a, a pretty good place to start. Once you've tracked your expenses and created your budget, you can begin to adjust the numbers to best suit your individual financial situation. Again, this isn't going to work for absolutely everybody. If, if you notice that the numbers are a bit out of whack, you can try and adjust those things. But it's all based on your personal financial situation, and, and you've got to decide what's the best approach to budgeting that makes the most sense for you. Of course, we can't forget savings, right? Uh, we call this paying ourselves or paying yourself. And it's just as important as paying your bills when it comes to building a strong financial foundation, a good footing for us to stand on. For that reason, you're gonna to wanna to include your savings in the 50% living expense category. When you think of savings as a necessary expense, even though the money is just going into your own savings vehicle, 
you're more likely to keep up with it, setting that money aside. This is uh, a part of finance that I think is getting a little bit more light shown on it now, which is behavioral finance and, and the mindset around money and just changing the paradigm a little bit and in how uh, uh, individuals' perception of money is. So um, if you put it in that 50% category, we know that it, it tends to lead to people being a bit more successful with, with saving. For planning purposes, you should target your savings to be about 10% of your monthly take-home pay. And that way, you're budgeting for a specific amount to be saved each and every month. The most important thing here is that you wanna get into the habit of saving and saving a predictable amount of money each month that is budgeted for. Um, and that's the best way to do it. So the biggest benefit of saving a predictable amount of money each month is that you'll have money to fall back on in case of an emergency or some unexpected large expense, right? In other words, the capacity to absorb a financial shock like we talked about at the beginning. Uh, money saved that you can quickly access will also provide you with more freedom to make choices that allow you to enjoy life. Once you set your monthly budget, understand that it's not a one-time event. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's not something set in stone, here we go, and, and I never have to look at it again. Budgeting, it's a process, and it'll be continuous, and it'll be ever-evolving throughout your lifetime. Review your budget regularly so you can think critically about which line items can be lowered, which ones can be raised, and which ones can be eliminated altogether. Make adjustments to your budget as your income, life priorities, and financial goals change and be prepared for the unexpected. Um, next, I think we'll spend a, a few minutes talking about being prepared within your budget for the unexpected. As we looked at building a budget earlier, we categorized our expenses by whether they were living, wants, or debt expenses. We may also wanna look at our budget in a different light so we can be as prepared as possible for an unexpected expense. This time, let's look at our expenses in a different way. We'll categorize the expenses as for yourself, for your family, for your community, and for your career. On screen, you'll see some examples of the type of things that would fall under each category. And these are things that we all spend money on, right? For, for ourselves as hobbies and uh, for family is things like um, education or insurance, your community, maybe charitable giving, something philanthropic, your career covering things like continuing education, licensing, um, registration fees, so on and so forth. Once you've recategorized your spending this way, you now have another lens to view your budget by recategorizing your expenses by yourself, your family, your community, and your career, you can now have more confidence and competency to better handle an unexpected expense. And you might be sitting there going, how does that help me at all? So let me explain. You have now reprioritized your spending. And by doing so, the decisions about where to cut spending in a given month to cover some unexpected expense may now be a bit easier to make. And spending on yourself often will be less of a priority than spending on your family for a given month. And maybe spending on your community is less valuable at a specific moment in time than cutting expenses that may help support your career. And based on your priorities for each category, you can now make adjustments to those lower priority expenditures to cover an unexpected cost. Let's say your budget takes an unexpected $500 hit for car repairs. Since you've already prioritized your spending, you'll have a pretty good idea where that money can come from before you even look at your budget. And knowing beforehand uh, where the money will come from gives you the confidence that you can handle or absorb the financial shock. Uh, you can handle an unexpected cost. This also gives you more freedom to make choices and helps you rely less on 
your savings and emergency funds to cover any sort of unexpected costs. This can help you, this can help make you and your budget more flexible and more adaptable. The bottom line is that you want to be prepared for an unexpected cost and looking at your budget through different lenses can help better manage your day to day and month to month finances. So let's review what we have discussed. Start tracking your expenses in detail. And in 30 days, you'll be ready to build your comprehensive budget. Another way to tackle some of this may be to look back at every credit card and debit card statement from the last six months. It's going to be eye-opening to say the least. When I first did it, I was uh, mad at myself <laughs> to, to say the least. Uh, it may be natural to want to bypass this step, but it's, it's critically important. We've, we've got to be honest with our, ourselves about our spending habits and numbers and statements, they, they don't lie. Um, without completing it, you'll never have an accurate budget. So find a method of tracking your expenses that works for your lifestyle. Once you know your expenses, plan next month's expenses using that 50, 30, 20 guideline. It's also critical that the very first month you have a budget, you, you live within your means. Follow your budget and don't take on any additional debt. This will help you to make more informed decisions about any adjustments you need to make sure your future monthly budget is, uh, is on par. Remember that the 50, 30, 20 is just a rule of thumb. Um, you know, you know what's going on in your financial life, you know the happening. So, um, you know, if this, if this doesn't fit within your financial picture, but it's something that you're striving to get to, uh, you know, just keep working at it. It's just a guideline, just a rule of thumb. Actively manage money and make concerted efforts to avoid impulse purchase, uh, purchases. Also remember that using your own money is always better than using somebody else's money. It may seem a bit old fashioned to paying cash, but there's some merit to using you know, good old fashioned cash or, or a debit card, assuming that there aren't any fees associated with using it, instead of credit cards. And simply put, it's easier to dig yourself into a budget hole when using credit than it is when using cash. Understand your expenses and identify which you can reduce or eliminate. Your budget is the primary tool you'll use to do this. And once you free up money from eliminated or reduced expenses, you'll use your budget to redirect that money to other things important to you, like savings or paying off a specific debt more quickly. And finally, be flexible and adaptable with your budget. Review regularly and have a plan in place beforehand to address any unexpected costs um, and their effect on your budget. So with that, uh, I will close here. Uh, I will put our details up on the screen, just in case anybody has any questions that pop up, uh, you know, after, after we go through the Q&A that you didn't think to ask or weren't comfortable asking. Um, thank you for your time. And I think we, we left quite a bit of time for questions. Uh, so who has the, the first question? I'm gonna stop sharing this so I can actually see. So a question that I'm, I'm often asked is, um, how long does it take to change a, a financial habit, you know, specifically around budgeting? And I don't, again, not everybody is, is the same. And most people have, uh, you know, not most people, everybody has different situations and different mindsets and different thoughts and perceptions about money. But when you make a conscious decision to make a change to habits, I've seen people where it took three months. Uh, I've seen some people where it took a month and they're like, I love this. I love the feeling of clarity and and enhancement. So it's definitely not a, a, a one a one 
one answer fits all. That's absolutely not the case. But I think that when you can utilize small wins to uh, uh, encourage yourself, I think that that makes a, a pretty big difference. Um, if people have questions, um, you may not see a chat feature. And so if you raise your hand, uh, these guys will click on you <laughs> and uh, and then you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, hopefully that seems accessible for folks, but I do have a question. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, right, a platform of tracking things, uh, I know you talked about like apps and some of those pieces, but um, Talk to us a little bit about spaces like an Excel or other formats that people can use um, to, to start tracking uh, and see, you know, month over month, how things progress. Yeah, so um, as far as apps go, I personally like Mint. Um, that's, that's a really good budget tracking. That's what I've utilized, um, I would say for, for a few years now. Um, an Excel spreadsheet is is easy. I think the tough part with with that is if uh, you know if, if you're on the go, it becomes very easy to to miss something, and then it becomes this tedious chore to go back and or keep the receipt or write things down and fill it in. Where you know if you just have an app on your phone or uh, if you have and does Excel have an app on the phone, Spence? Do you know that? I think so. Yeah, I'm sure you could get one. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure Excel also has a budgeting template, if I remember correctly. You know, th again, the, the point is to create the habit, track it accurately. It'll be eye opening and then make adjustments from there. Um, but good old, you know, good old fashioned pen and paper. Again, that's that's a bit tedious, but um, it works. <laughs> Ashley raised her hand. Hi, Ashley. Hello. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Perfect. What would you say the relationship between building credit but also budgeting? Like, it just seems like I want to build my credit, but I don't want to spend money. And so I know there are ways to improve your credit that do involve balancing like debts, like a debt ratio and all these things. Do you have any advice sure. on, on sort of balancing those two? So there's multiple factors to going into to building credit, right? Things like credit age is a big thing. Things like um, ongoing uh, on-time payments are a big thing. Open accounts also are, are relatively big. So one of the ways that um, I, I don't want to be rude and, and ask your, your age, but if, if you're younger, um, one of the ways that can help immediately build credit is being added as an authorized user onto um, maybe a sibling's or, or another parent's credit card. Um, that'll boost, that'll get your, you know, more accounts opened. That isn't necessarily you taking on uh, the debt. That's one way to do it. There, it, it it's, it's hard to, to answer. Like, I want to give you a very, very specific answer so, so I can help you, but I don't, I don't know your situation. So um, you also have like 0% introductory credit cards where there'll be 0% for 12 or 18 months. You can open up one of those and just buy your groceries or, or gas or pay the cable bill with it. Um, and that'll get you on time payments and you're not paying any interest on it. So it's not that you are taking on, you know, an immense amount of debt for, for interest. Is that helpful, Ashley? Yes, thank you. I, I am young and I'm just so confused <laughs> with what I should be doing to make sure that I have good credit when I own a home, but then making sure that I can save for a mortgage payment or a down payment on a mortgage, all this money stuff. Just want so, to make sure I have my ducks in a row. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's, there's a balance to everything. And, and I think an important thing to, to, to understand is that there's a big difference between good debt and bad debt, right? Bad debt uh, are things like 
credit card payments and auto loans, um, bad debt, right? And the reason that they're bad debt is because they don't appreciate in value, right? Credit cards are typically um, impulse purchases for, for younger individuals, or it's the vacation, we'll just throw it on the credit card. Um, some people use them intelligently and they'll use them for points for their travel points and, and they, know how to, they know how to work the system to, to make it work for them, but majority of people don't. So that's bad debt. Good debt are things like student loans, right? And the reason that that's good debt is because it's providing you with an education that's going to provide you with a lifetime of income, right? Um, it's going to appreciate beyond the value of what you took out for that loan. A mortgage is really good debt, right? Because it has the opportunity to appreciate beyond the value of the mortgage. Business loans, really good debt. It has the opportunity to appreciate beyond the value of, of the loan. So I think one thing that might be good for you, Ashley, is if you sit down and you look at your expenses, what's the, uh, out of 100%, what's the percentage of it going towards living expenses? What's the percentage of it going towards um uh, wants and what's the percentage of it going towards debt, right? And if those are wildly out of whack, then I think having a budget and starting to balance those things is incredibly important. I would also say that building a savings, you know, a, a, a good savings, it's not something that happens overnight. Like we all want hundred grand sitting in our account. So, you know, we can put our 10% or 20% down on the house and, and not have to worry about it. Something comes up. The, the reality is those things, they, they, they don't happen overnight, right? It might take five years, but five years of really good habits will put you in a, in a tremendous place. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a good question. Thank you for asking. What other questions do we have? Oh, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, can you hear me? I sure can. Oh, for some reason now I can't hear you guys. <laughs> Can you hear me now? What the heck? Weird. Um, I don't test. Know. Oh, test, test. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Here we go. We figured it out. All right, perfect. So my name is Sarah, and I just had a question um, in regards to some advice you could provide on um you know, just kind of planning for the future. So I've been looking into something called a Roth IRA. Um, and I wanted to just kind of gauge your guys' opinion on that. And if you think that, you know, I'm, I'll, I, I will share my age, I don't mind, I'm 27. So just knowing that and kind of thinking about future planning and would that be something where we should, you know, invest in that at this point? Okay, so, um... I think that the Roth IRA and IRAs in general are the second best financial product ever created. Uh, and it's only behind uh, an HSA, which is a health savings account. Um, I think that at 27 years old, if you are contributing to your 401k or 403b up to the match, and you're doing that consistently, then without knowing any other details. Uh, a Roth IRA is, is, uh, is a, a great investment, right? So a good thing to know is that IRAs, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, 401k, so on and so forth, these things are simply um, shells. And, and the shell dictates how that money is taxed coming in and how that money is taxed going out. What's important is what's inside of the shell. What are you investing in, right? Because that's going to determine what are the returns, right? Some Roths do amazing and some Roths do terrible. And it's not because of the Roth. It's because of how it's being invested inside of that. So everything in, in financial planning is, is a balance. Uh, so 
I think if you're contributing to your 403k, or your 403b or your 401 k and you're doing that up to the match uh, and you're looking at a Roth IRA, I think a Roth IRA is, is a great investment to make. Um, but I would take what's called a, a personal risk assessment or a personal risk tolerance questionnaire. And I think that that'll help you uh, understand what, what is your appetite for risk at, at this point in your life and what's the amount of risk that you should be taking on when you're thinking about investing in, uh, you know, outside of, of your company's uh, retirement funds. Um, there was another point that I wanted to make. Oh, another good thing to know is that <clears throat> um, you can only contribute. Now this changes year to year, Sarah. So make sure that you're looking at this or you're gonna get hit with a tax bill. Um, and I'm not giving tax advice. <laughs> it's not tax advice. Um, you can only you can only contribute up to six thousand dollars into uh, a Roth IRA or IRAs in general, um, and it's only up to, and I I might be a little off on this number, but it's only up to uh, individuals who make one hundred eighteen thousand dollars of adjusted gross income. Um, once you go beyond that one hundred that one hundred that one hundred eighteen thousand dollars of adjusted gross income, you no longer have the well, it becomes more difficult to begin to allocate money to a Roth IRA. You have to do something that's called a backdoor Roth IRA, but we, we won't get into that. We won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, did that answer your question, Sarah? I, I did a lot of talking there. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I've been a little, uh, you know, kind of leery about it. So I think that just hearing the advice that you gave was helpful. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I think that anything new we get, we get a bit, you know, worried about, right? Like I, I, um, I work with a good amount of nurses and I always tell them like, I can never walk onto your floor and, and you know, I don't know, do intravenous or anything, right? Like I'd be freaked out taking blood pressure. So uh, new things, especially things that, that we don't know about and are outside of our comfort zone, um, they can be daunting. And you know, information today is everywhere. I mean, you can Google something and you get a million different views with a bunch of different conflicting information. And it's like, well, that sounds good, but that also kind of makes sense. Like, what is it? What is what, what should I be doing for my situation? Um, so I, I totally get it. Totally get it. Thank you. Good questions. Anybody else? I was going to say, we probably have time for another one more question and then we'll yeah. wrap up at 845. Sounds like a plan. Ashley, Sarah, do you guys have any other questions? No, not at this time. I'll definitely let all this marinate later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will share our details one more time, just in case you want to um, write down our email addresses or our phone numbers if you want to shoot us an email with a question or send us over a text. Um, you know, more than more than happy to um, you know have a conversation and, and help in any way that we can. With that, Allie, I'll hand it back over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you again, um, Josh and Spencer, for hosting tonight. Uh, we appreciate your flexibility um, and doing this later. Uh, I know it's past my bedtime. <laughs> um, and yeah, just to thank you for everyone that uh, came, asked questions. Um, hopefully, you know, you learned something uh, about budgeting, ways to improve, things to start, um, new practices to, to move forward with. Um, I will just mention if any of you have suggestions for future topics or events, uh, I invite you to send me an email. Um, hopefully you all got reminder emails from me the past couple of days about this event. Um, and so please reach out um, if you have any suggestions. We're always looking for new ideas um, and new folks uh, in our alumni community to host events like these as well. If you have something that uh, you're really passionate about or have um, extensive knowledge in that area. Uh, we do have a few other events happening um, this spring uh, with our Global Days of Service uh, happening now and th through May. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, but again, thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you for those in attendance and um, hope you all have a fantastic evening.
Allie, one, one more thing before we hop off here. If sure anybody thing. wants the budgeting tool that we send our clients, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll shoot it right over to you. Um, that's, that's something that helps a, a lot of people. Gives it a nice structure. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a great night, everybody.